Happy hunting season. Yeah. Well, greetings, Kevin. You're a brave guy. He invited Ted Nugent here to Wayne. Is this Wayne, Nebraska? Home of a triple cock limit. Is that right? You get three birds. Smart ass. Okay. Okay, he listed all the important stuff that I do and that I am, but did he mention I scare white people with the guitar? That's my career. Uh, I'm here today because uh, you have too many pheasants, and you have too many deer, and too many ducks and geese and turkeys, and obviously too many hippies, because I have to come all the way from Detroit and balance the herd. <laughs> I'll be 51 in December, and I've been hunting every year of my life. I was born in 1948, and my mom and dad raised our family to be uh, conscientious, alert, aware stewards of those precious resources that bring us quality of life. And though I'm just a stupid guitar player, I figured out upon graduating from high school, yes, I did graduate from high school. I didn't go to college because I was too busy learning shit. But, um, no, I'm only serious. <laughs> I hope you're having a nice party, by the way. Uh, I figured it out all by myself that uh, when I first uh, left home after graduating from high school, I had a band called the Amboy Dukes, and we didn't have enough money to buy much stuff other than guitar strings and new speakers. Kept blowing up those speakers, you know. It's a good sign that you're not playing country and western music. Uh, though there are a couple of country and western fans here today, I can tell by the turd in your lip, uh, you're, you're, you're more than welcome to stay. <laughs> no, I think that's cute. <laughs> what is that turd in, but what is that? Girls, do you kiss that stuff? What is going on with the turd? But I figured, I figured if the uh, Amboy Dukes were going to heat their house, that we'd need some firewood. So I would cut firewood, and because I was raised as a hunter, taught to always put more back into nature than I take out, uh, I, I felt a driving spirit to return to the good Mother Earth, even in my teenage years, that I should put more back in than I take out. So I started planting trees in 1969. And I planted a minimum just on my own accord, not because it was hip or some hippie figured out Earth Day would be cute. I just figured if I was gonna cut a tree, I should probably return something. So I started planting a thousand trees a year in 1969. And I've planted a minimum of a thousand every year since that year. And I'm just a guitar player. So, when the state of Michigan names me Conservationist of the Year or the Arbor Day Foundation, what I think they're really doing is they're taking advantage of the celebrity that I may be blessed with and bringing visibility to an environmental awareness, hands-on, that is very stimulating, very compelling. Uh, I did say stimulating. There is a sensuality to all my outdoors experiences. There is a sens sensuality to the... Uh, act of digging a hole and plunging your mitts into the good olfactory stench of Mother Earth's bowels. You gotta love that. And with my own Ted Nugent Camp for Kids that we started 11 years ago, we have spread and uh, motivated this experience into the lives of a lot of young people um, in a strange world out there where activities that otherwise inspire a lot of those young people uh, end up causing death and mayhem and trauma and heartbreak and if not just destruction of quality of life, the end of life itself. So I've always gotten high on nature and the outdoor activities that have inspired me to hunt and fish and trap and provide sustenance for my family's dinner table while at the same time making sure that I optimize my return for this habitat that brings me such a stimulating wildlife encounter. And I think even just for the most selfish of reasons, if I want to experience the dynamic of a flushing bird over a pointing dog with my son at my side, or 
the dynamic of a frosty morning arrival of majestic white-tailed deer, big game, abounding in this country, then I will do what is ever necessary to bring this exciting dynamic to my life. But in the process, by optimizing this wildlife habitat to bring me optimum encounters, I am in fact perfecting, and remember, I'm just a guitar player. Nonetheless, I am in fact perfecting the very system that provides all of us a quality of air, soil, and water, because that's where deer live. And I love to go there. In fact, this morning is the first morning since, since September 5th that I haven't hunted in the morning. That's because I had to catch a flight out of Detroit so I could hunt here tonight. But it's a very, it's a very powerful, uh, spiritual driving force in the Nugent family's life, as it is, I have a feeling for many of you. Are there many hunters out here today? Go ahead, raise your hand, you whips. Okay, many hunters. Any animal rights folks here? Because I'd like you to sit right up front. <laughs> Anybody here consider themselves an animal rights supporter? Come right down front here. We'll get you a turd. <laughs> uh, so in pursuit of this outdoor dynamic, certain political agencies who are often cautious who they align themselves with, and certain dedicated environmental organizations that are also cautious who they align themselves with, have seen fit to get through my erect ponytail career in all this fear-mongering and actually give me these Conservationists of the Year award because I bring visibility without apologizing and without catch and release nonsense. My family eats meat and it's dead. And I get it dead for the table. You can't grill it till you kill it. <laughs> Any questions you can call 1-800-NUMNUT and Michael Jackson will bring a chimpanzee to your home. <laughs> and you can pet him. That's not funny. <laughs> I think it's hilarious. <laughs> and if you don't have a sense of humor, run now to the doors. <laughs> run as fast as you possibly can. Flee this man. <laughs> you notice this figure is already wounded. <laughs> <laughs> so what I do in between bouts of sonic bombast and scaring people with, with my guitar, which I just completed the greatest tour of my life in 1999. I have the world's greatest band. If you didn't get to see me this year, which is a few of you who have, I can see the way you glow. Uh, the energy, the enthusiasm, the passion, the spirituality, the dedication to my musical vision all comes from the same source that that deer and that pheasant and that duck and that goose and that air and soil and water spring forth. We live on a big chunk called planet Earth. We're the only reasoning being therein. And with all due respect to Patch Adams, man is not the only kind, the only species that abuses his own kind. When man is at his best, which I think the incredible success story of more wild turkeys in America than in recorded history, more white-tailed deer, even in the face of vulgar rape of the hills urban sprawl, more wildfowl than in a hundred years after the slaughter by the marketeers and the fashion world. And we can get into that during the question and answer. But man at his best, when he truly gives a damn, can accomplish anything. And I couldn't be more proud in this day and age to be a hunter and to be a fisherman and a trapper literally guaranteeing a hands-on value for these precious resources that give me such stimuli and flesh for the table, thereby putting a dollar value on that experience and the ground that will support these resources so that our air, soil, and water quality will be maintained. And as we approach the millennium, right around the clock here, I think as I see headlines in the Wall Street Journal and the USA Today and the Scientific American and US News and World Report, and I see these headlines all over the journalism 
horizon. Man is scrambling to return to nature as healer. Well, for those of you that are scrambling and considering it, though I am in the heartland, I have a funny feeling I'm not surprising anybody with any of these irrefutable statistics I'm spewing forth. If you really want to optimize the healing qualities of nature, man will have to stop the bulldozer boogie. Man will have to stop the rape of the hills. Enough malls and golf courses already. And nature will heal if we maintain a hands-on value system for these wild pieces of ground that still provide this outdoor dynamic. And with that in mind, uh, at the age of 51, I'm reasonably bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, cocked, locked, and ready to rock and healthy because when all my peers were experimenting with the poisons on the top 10 trend list, I was giving them the finger and getting my Irish setters and going bird hunting because I never put any poisons in my body, never had any alcohol, drugs, or tobacco in my body. My body is much too important to me to do that. So when Jimmy and Janice and John Belushi and Bon Scott and Keith Moon and John Candy and everybody else was getting high and laughing at me because I was a hunter and they were making fun of me because I carried a gun, they all got high and they're all dead. I went hunting and I'm still dead. Does this ring any bells? <laughs> <laughs> so it's not even a matter of opinion. I, I haven't stated any opinions yet. I'll get into some opinions later on. <laughs> I'm merely stating the truth. And I abide by a much more powerful law than opinion or trend. My mom and dad raised me to open my intellect, open my eyes, open my sensuality to nature's law. And it was such a powerful blessing, such a powerful experience. And it remains so to this day, even more so now than it's ever been. Because the stress level is going beyond the red line and we all need our outdoor peace and spirituality now more than ever. That is nature at its finest healing property. So I maintain my lifestyle in touch with nature's law and make sure that I really hump my intellect. I, I, I get, let the juices flow so that I can optimize my understanding via it can be gauged literally by the amount of hunting boots a person wears out. If you haven't worn out any hunting boots, you don't have the right to an opinion about nature yet. You don't qualify. Because you can't figure out nature from a book or from behind a desk. And I would welcome anyone who's never been there. I, I, I know a bunch of you have already wallowing and squirming because you know what I'm talking about because you do it, you feel it, you live it, you acknowledge it. And many of you, many of the people in this world don't participate necessarily hands-on because it's rugged, it's demanding, it's challenging, it's exploratory, it's uncomfortable oftentimes on the surface. But I know many of you do indulge in the outdoor activities and I know that you know it's not Ted's opinion, it is nature's law and it is reality and it is the truth. And any of you that don't, I would beckon you, I would offer you via my nature an invitation to really feel the best of your sensuality, the best of your gifts from God in all their optimum glory by getting out as often as you possibly can, preferably during the most dynamic season of all, and that is the fall hunting season, where we harvest the surplus because that productivity from spring and summer cannot be maintained through the winter. It can't be done. If you don't harvest the surplus, it will die and rot and go to waste. And we mustn't have that, must we? Little garlic and butter, you got perfection. So that's why I'm here today, because Kevin's a brave man. He invited the whack master. 
and that's just my guitar nickname, by the way, to come and speak with you about my passion, my joy, my love of all things outdoors, all things beyond the pavement. And I find an exploding, a galvanizing run across the hinterland in America to return to nature as healer. And in those families that have always hunted, those families that have always sought that quality family time beyond the pavement, fishing, hiking, trapping, shooting, grilling, we welcome you to this universal campfire that is nature in all its tooth, fang, and claw, good, bad, and ugly glory. And if you really want to be the very best that you can be, you'll want to learn to really stimulate all that there is about us through your time in nature. And I'm sure I could go on and on about what it has represented to my life and to many of my friends' lives, but uh, I think it'd be more interesting if we were to open it up to questions and answers. Now, Kevin, you were talking about going to a different area to question and answer? No, oh, the media. Well, the media can kiss. Oh. Oh, I love the media. I am the media. <laughs> but I'm here today not only because Kevin has requested me, not just on behalf of myself as an individual American and the Nugent family, but I also represent a lot of people in this country. And they have seen fit in scrutinizing my reputation and my language and my points and my delivery of the self-evident truths that is nature. And I would like to mention those organizations because I'm very proud to represent them having been uh, voted in and having been elected and appointed to represent the National Rifle Association of America, the National Field Archery Association of America, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, Big Brothers and Big Sisters, the Drug Abuse Resistance Education Program, and anything that goes bang or twang all guns, all bows, all sharp-edged weapons, I represent them all. <laughs> so at this point, um, any specific questions? Can we just, just spit it out? If you speak nice and loud, I can hear you. Or if you yell. Anybody special? Well, let me clarify that. The gentleman wants to know what I would recommend we do, and boy, I can do more than recommend because I've been doing it, to counter the nonsense that is the animal rights transparency. How can an animal have rights when you eat them? How can animals have rights following a 4th of July barbecue? I, on an intellectual level, someone help me out here. You turn their flesh, you add salt, and they have rights. What part do I, am I what am I not getting here? Anybody, I'm sure someone hates me and they want to say something. Come on, baby, spit it out. <laughs> and typically, typically, our critics are cowards. They're spineless. On an intellectual level, they got nothing. They're Michael Jackson fans and they're ashamed of themselves. <laughs> Animals have rights to garlic and butter. Um, what we need to do, my friend, is you say that the hunting community is a large number, but we're quiet. No, we're not. We're a huge number, and we're apathetic weenies. <laughs> the hunters of this country, they are so full of shit, it makes me want to throw up. That's the problem. If you're not a member of the NRA, if you're not a member of your local sporting organization, if you're not a member of your state sporting organization, you are a wimp. If you can't stand up and be counted, when this country was based on self-evident truths, if you want to talk about firearms ownership, Al Gore and Bill Bradley want only military and law enforcement to have rights to weapons. That's already law in Cuba. It's Bill calling. <laughs> I'm speaking live in 
Nebraska. Say hello. Hey, who's this? <laughs> Hi, Gary. I'm in front. I'm in front of. Say hello to Gary. Hi, Gary. I'll, I'll call you back. <laughs> All right, uh, did you get a big deer? All right. Why not? Oh, did you hear the new one? And what do you think of my new song? He loves my new song. <laughs> I'll call you back, Gary. All right. And he didn't get a big deer yet. But he heard my new song. He'll kill one tonight. <laughs> Anyhow, where were we? Oh, yeah. Bill Bradley and Al Gore and Bill Clinton and Sarah Brady and Janet Reno and Diane Feinstein and Barbara Boxer. They're on record. Only military and law enforcement should have access to any weapons at all. Not assault weapons, not little guns, not big guns, not easily concealable guns, not short barrels, not long barrels, not high capacity, not low capacity. They want only military and law enforcement to have access to weapons. They're on record. That's already law in Cuba. Kiss my all-American black ass. <laughs> That's how I feel. And I'm from Detroit and I am black. You'll, I'm huge. I'm, I'm Nugent, it's the N-word. What can I tell you? It's pretty going to the <laughs> Anybody that doesn't believe that the Constitution is about individual rights is brain dead and a dangerous person. And if you believe that you have the right, that God gave you the right to defend yourself, you better get off your apathetic ass and join the National Rifle Association today. If not, move to Cuba. They have laws that are perfect for you. And regarding animal rights people, they are so laughable as to be pathetic, except that the media loves the little cuties, and it makes for controversy that sells media stuff. That's it in a nutshell. But if the media will give visibility to that brain-dead goofiness, it's only because the brain-dead goofballs are speaking up. We don't get the visibility because our so-called hunting organizations are lame. They don't speak up. I just wrote a piece. I write for 28 publications. I wrote a piece on the way here in the airplane today about the 10 steps of a successful hunt, about praying for the wild things, about becoming proficient with your methodology. If it's black powder, if it's handgun, if it's shotgun, if it's bow and arrow, if it's crossbow, you must practice to become proficient because as a reasoning, thinking, caring, conscientious predator, we want that animal to die now. We don't eat it like, while it's still alive like nature's predators do, the other nature's predators. We want to kill that animal cleanly. We want to only harvest the surplus so that the main population thrives on because it's the condition of that wildlife that determines the quality of so many of our lives. But if one of the main points of my 10-step program is that we must promote the sensations that we feel and crave beyond the pavement. We must initiate that dialogue at home, at the workplace, in school, everywhere we go. We must initiate the dialogue that self-evident truth should become evident once again. And it's going to be up to ourselves to bring that to higher visibility. So the sporters, the conservationists, if you believe in anything, stand up for it. Because I'm convinced that if you seek the truth, if you intellectually screen the information, you will come to the conclusion that our founding fathers came to, and that I have come to. That wildlife is food, and God gave me the right to defend myself. And anyone who wants to keep me from doing that, I'm going to have to shoot them. <laughs> you think I'm being silly. We celebrate the 4th of July because the British came to get our guns. We shot them dead. We didn't negotiate. We didn't compromise. We shot them. That's why you're here. That's why everybody wants to come to America. Because we're free. We're in charge of our individual lives. God gave me the right to defend myself. No one can hurt my family. And if you take away private ownership of firearms, you're opening the door to insanity. 
<laughs> Professor John Lott and David Mustard out of the University of Chicago conducted an 18-year study of 3,054 jurisdictions which broke down their zip codes in the United States. And ir irrefutably, conclusively, where there are more concealed weapons per capita, more access to more firepower per capita across all socioeconomic borders, there is a dramatic reduction in violent crime. Who, in God's name, would be against a reduction in violent crime? Whereas, where there are the more stringent of gun laws reducing access to firearms, there is a proportionate dramatic increase in violent, particularly firearms associated crimes. Who would be for that? I'll tell you who, Bill Clinton, Bill Bradley, Al Gore, Sarah Brady, Diane Feinstein, and Janet Reno, whatever the hell she is. <laughs> My dog got downwind of that wench and wouldn't point for a week. <laughs> She's a pig. Okay. I'll let you know when I get to my opinions, by the way. These are all documented <laughs> scientific. <laughs> Am I pissing anybody off yet? I'd, uh, I'd You're like not to. You're pissing off the pardon? I, I'd, I'd like to put your comments in a slightly different context. You said something very, you said a couple things very important. One I'm of them. Glad, I'm glad you think so. Uh, no, I, I really do. One of Thanks. them being is that when you um, take down a tree, you plant a tree. Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, not a tree. I think if you take down a tree, you should plant hundreds. I plant thousands. I, 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 uh, I concur, okay? <laughs> and secondly, um, you mentioned in your uh, 10 points of hunting that um, you should say a prayer uh, to the animal uh, before you kill the animal. I assume that's what you mean. Well, I'll clarify that. About, yeah. about eight years ago, I wrote an article, we call them editorials, um, called Prayer for the Wild Things, and how in my developing years as a hunter, when I finally made a kill, it took me 17 years to get my first year. <laughs> so I just about danced naked and humped oak trees. I was <laughs> Which in its, in its own way was a prayer for the wild people. Like, finally I got the damn arrow to go where I was looking. Um, I really believe that the high fives and the celebration, the Indians did it, they smoked peyote and they lost the damn war. Uh, I really do consider that a prayer, but now at the age of 51 I have backed off the oak trees a bit. But um, what I do is now I promote this unquestionable spirituality when one connects with the very fiber that brings you a next day of life. And so I have, even in my goofy guitar approach, I did write Wang Dang Sweet Plume Tang, and that's a prayer too, kind of. Um, I, I do encourage, in fact, I have promoted voluminously, that means loud, uh, praying in your own words, maybe not, maybe not words, maybe in your own actions. I find that as I gut that animal, that I examine that plumbing that I had to circumvent, I had to defeat. That's some serious shit in there. I couldn't do that. I don't know how he made that stuff. That's fascinating. All them veins and all that liver and that pancreas, what, and that stuff. This. This is spiritual stuff. It's called the physics of spirituality. It's coming to the face, face to face, scent to scent, spirit to spirit with these creatures. And that's not just respect, it's reverence. And I, I may be, and I'm a goofy, I'm an uppity son of a gun. I, I know how to live. I'm, I'm this, every minute's a party. When I sleep, I'm party. Not with the dope, not with the bullshit, with, with real fiber. And I'm the first outdoor writer, so to speak, that has talked about this prayer system. And when I plant those trees with those children every year from the inner city, and I see their, their, their indecent misguidance towards trend death, I see their eyes clear up brighten up, I see their demeanor become more pleasant, more spirited, more buoyant. 
as they just get a good whiff of that ground and they put the tree in there, all of a sudden it's their tree. These are all prayers. Prayers aren't just the Our Father. That's a good one. But a prayer must be how we conduct ourselves. In words, as a speaking critter, I think it's one of the best. But I appreciate you bringing those two points yeah, to the, the forefront. Re the reason why I, I did, and you even mentioned uh, Native Americans, I live among the indigenous people of this state. And uh, when I see them gut a hog or gut a deer or uh, you know, a pheasant or, or uh, you know, uh, take uh, the harvest uh, in terms of the crops they plant, while I do live among a dysfunctional community, which a lot of our ancestry from Europe brought to them, and that's part of the reason why they're in such dire straits throughout the country right now. Boy, where have I heard that before? And, yes, and, ma'am. Yeah, absolutely. And, but I would, I would have to say that much of what you're saying in between the lines of what you're saying is very much of contemporary traditional indigenous thought and practice Bingo. and it would seem to me and this is the question I really want to raise with you if our culture our Indo-European American culture has a tradition that is anti-nature while professing a belief in God how can we in the 21st century address those who believe in continuing the spiritual practice of being anti-nature while professing in a savior or a god known as Mohammed or a practice known as Buddhism or any of those kinds of spiritual practices that uh, desensitize ourselves to the kinds of thinking that you're advocating today. First of all, our, our European ancestry does not have a tradition of anti-nature. It is a recent phenomenon. It came with the Industrial Revolution and TV dinners, simpler is somehow better, when in fact, making things easier is the curse of an obese society. A society that's 50% obese. And if we can't manage our bodies, what must our souls look like? So this, is, this animal rights insanity, indecency, vulgarity, obscenity, is a recent phenomena of intentional dissociation our crime against nature is not the bulldozer. Our crime against nature is a comfort distance of miles between us and the slaughterhouse that allows us to ferment a denial that somehow we are complicit in the act of beheading our McNuggets. That was pretty good. You get that on tape? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I didn't even go to college. That was brilliant shit. <laughs> I, that made perfect sense. Now, did you follow me on that? Only someone who can claim they didn't spill any oil from the Exxon Valdez because they weren't on board would be so insanely consumed by denial that somehow those greasy shorebirds were someone else's fault as we start up our car as we turn up our thermostat, as we get our plastic bags out of the cover ad nauseum. Are you with me? Do you know what I'm talking about? If you've used a product, and that product has caused an, env an environmental hell, you, my friends, are as guilty as the drunken captain of that ship as am I, because if you and I had to carry our precious, precious oil from source of procurement to destination, I guarantee you wouldn't spill it if it would find its way into your water table. And so goes the flesh for my family's dinner table. I'm not going to hire some stogie chomping fat pig to dice up a bunch of Cornish hens for me, bleeding all over his white apron with green slime rolling down his elbow as he throws it into a vat of piss and shit so we can have a guaranteed 100% salmonella infested poultry feast. You think I'm making this up, don't you? USDA, the bureaucrats at work, 100% of domestic poultry is infected with salmonella 
not my pheasants, not my quail, not my grouse, not my doves, not my turkey, because nature heals, and they don't eat their own shit. Any questions? <laughs> so the answer is quite simply, stand up for what you believe in, initiate that dialogue. If you want to have a party, you got to be alive. If you want to be alive, you got to eat good shit. If you want to eat good shit, you can't have some guy selling salmonella and E. coli in saran wrap. Next. <laughs> Somebody's got to track down the dirty soil and find out who did it and lynch him. And you know who did it? We did it. We crashed the XM Valdez because we want cheap gas and we ain't going to pay for triple hull tankers and we're going to let Fitzpatrick go in there with a couple of martinis up his ass. And we don't care because we'll let them clean up the cormorants coated with 10W50. Apathetic, obese, denial pigs. That's what we are in America. I killed an elephant in Africa. Somebody said, well, aren't they endangered? I said, one was. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Kinison learned all this stuff from me, believe me. Before he met me, he didn't scream. Um, when I killed that elephant, I watched the natives come from Zimbabwe, Botswana, and South Africa. I didn't, I didn't even know they were there. They just all of a sudden started showing up. And by the next morning, I swear they took the sand that was bloodied with them. Nothing went to waste. They ate the fart. <laughs> I'm using an extreme example here to try to get my point across. <laughs> this elephant fed thousands of natives whose very lives are determined by their access to protein. We split the bones, we scraped out the marrow. You're talking about Native Americans, it's Native Earthlings. In America, we'd have, we'd have took the prime ribs and left the rest there to rot. And if you don't believe me, next time you go to a, a meal, check out what's thrown away that you paid for. Next time you have kids over to your house and they pour a bowl of cereal, watch how much milk goes down the drain and how much food is scraped into the trash bin. And I don't know about you, but we don't allow that in our house. I paid for that food. I killed that deer. I will be damned if we're going to throw any of that away. And when I fill up my, tank, my truck with gas, I don't start the fuel flowing on the ground because in America, that's what we do. We just pour about 10 bucks out on the ground and go, okay, now we can put some in the tank. That's what you do with your food. We are obnoxious, wasteful, spoiled brats in this country. And it coincides with the development of an animal rights mentality. So you want environmentalism, I'm just a stupid guitar player. I write love songs for a living. <laughs> and on a hunch, I started planting a thousand trees for every one I cut down. Some years it was 5,000. Some years there was a drought and they all died. I just I took my shirt off the next spring and started thrusting seedlings back in again. And you should see my property at home. It's a damn forest. It's incredible. I mean, we got 75-foot white pines and blue spruce and jack pines. It's a forest. And I walk there with my children, and each year we plant more trees. And each year we sit there in the deer blind, and we see the juncos and the chickadees and the tufted titmosses and the, the evening gross beaks. And we name the birds, and my kids see one fly, and they go, well, that's a cardinal, it's a male. There's a rose-breasted gross beak, Dad. Look, some cedar wax wings, they fly in a formation. So if we leave this room with nothing else, at least buy my new song. No. <laughs> if we leave this room with nothing else, 
whether you agree with me or you think I have an attitude. <laughs> I invented the middle finger back in 51, and I'll be damned if I'm not going to get some mileage out of it. Uh, if nothing else, you've got to know in your heart you have to believe. If you don't believe, what in the hell are you doing? Believe and then stand up for that belief. And if on an intellectual level, your beliefs are firebound, you're convinced in your heart and soul and your intellect, then inspire, motivate, or shame the people you know to stand up with you. And check out the air. The air is different in the spring than it is in the summer. Respond to that barometric dynamic. You will be drawn in to plant in the spring. So during the summer, the natural season of growth, you can appreciate it. Come the fall, you'll see how things change. Come the death of winter, it won't, it won't be ugly. It'll be in preparation for the next cycle. And if each and every one of us next spring planted 10 trees, you can get them for like two cents a piece from the agriculture department. In fact, you go to the Arbor Day Foundation, you join up, you get 25 bucks a year, you get the literature, like, what do you give you? 30 trees or some damn thing. Want to have a party? Put down the booze and the dope and the bullshit. Get some seedlings. Pack a lunch. In fact, right now you can do it. This is a good time to plant stuff. If you don't own any property, do it on state land. You got state land here. Your dad, somebody, an uncle, somebody's got, you do it in your front yard. Get a big old ass pine forest going. <laughs> Go squirrel hunting there in 10 years. <laughs> squirrel fricassee, garlic and butter, yum. But that's what I'm really here to do. I took the invitation because I do have a date with a big South Dakota and Nebraska buck tonight. And I come here to hunt every year because uh, my family has never, ever bought meat. We only eat the game that we kill with our own gifts, our own stealth, our own cunning, our own reason, our own proficiency. We only eat the game that we kill. Well, we love leg of lamb and the sheep farmers get pretty pissed off, I'll tell you that. <laughs> He'll be fine. <laughs> so I would encourage you, if any of you guys or any of you gals, good looking babes in here today. Ain't nothing like good looking babe with a gun. <laughs> and a big old haunch of venison slung over his shoulder. Forget the makeup, forget that stinky stuff, hose your ass down, down at the local truck wash and get out there and kill something for me, would you? You think I'm kidding? Just think of the money you could save on all that crap. Oh, sacred ground, eh, girls? <laughs> My wife, Shemaine, she has an organization called the Queen of the Forest, and she's so fine, it's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and she killed a big old buck with her bow and arrow, and God, was she fun that night. <laughs> Not a hurt mine. <laughs> I'm, I'm a comedian. This is all just prepared material. I, so it's just a joke. All my kids hunt. I have two beautiful daughters. My daughter Star is 29. My daughter Sasha is 25. My son Toby is 22. My little boy Rocco is 9. And that's all we eat is pure, natural, organic flesh from the game that we kill by our own hand. And it is so good for you. It is so delicious. <laughs> I mean, beef tastes like that country western turd to me. I mean, not nothing against you beef farmers. I get a great business going. God bless the white fat beef. And I eat that when I'm on the road when I can't find venison. But that's how I've conducted my life for the last 30 years. And I will continue to become more and more cause and effect conscious in my walking this community that we share called Earth. Anybody else? Another question? That was good. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, 
The abuse, yeah, I hate when hunters get abused. You're absolutely correct. I, <laughs> no, I think what you're talking about, there is, there is an element in the sporting community that, there's some, and, and that's directly in relation to this gentleman's question. What can we do? Number one, if you have a buddy that violates the game laws, turn him in. We got to get rid of these punks in the hunting sports because they're a, they're, a, they're a minuscule minority. But when Dan Rather does a show on hunting, he doesn't do it about the millions and millions of fathers and sons. He'll find some drunken, inbred, fat fool drooling all over himself that's shooting gallbladders from some horny oriental. Did you get that? Shooting gallbladders for a horny oriental. <laughs> I don't know why they have such a hard time with that. <laughs> so the, the, the only story about hunting we see with high visibility are the ugly ones that rather and bro cause CBS and NBC and all these manipulative conspiratorial scum in the media put together to intentionally misrepresent us. Don't think I'm kidding. I, it's absolutely guaranteed. Because for every game law violation, there are a million wholesome hours of activity. But the way we do it is the same answer to this gentleman. Let's, in a sporting community, get active. The violators, the drunken punks, get them the hell out. I've been saying the same thing about the rock and roll community. But that's in a nutshell. There are priests that molest children. That's not the priesthood. There are men and women in the hunting community that are vulgar and obscene and are criminals. That is not the hunting culture. We have who? You, you've actually, with your own eyes, now that I want the truth, you've seen them shoot hawks and bluebirds. And what you do about it? And did they get caught to prosecute them? Well, then what we need to do with it, but you know what you brought up is a much bigger issue. How about the guys that saw little girls' arms off after they raped them and throw them to the side of the road and some judge lets her out? So we're not even talking about honey. We're talking about a ju criminal justice system that is brain dead and absolutely counter to the very common sense pulse of this nation. So you're talking about a, a, a criminal uh, justice system that's criminal. Well, you're talking all these outrageous violations. And, you know, I've been hunting every year. I was on my dad's back October of 1949. I was 10 months old. I have never missed a hunting season since 1949. And I've booked over 200 hunters this year on my own hunts. I book hunts in Africa twice a year. I sold out my hunts opening day bow season. I hunt these special uh, areas in Texas and California to bear hunt. We had hundreds and hundreds of hunters. We log hundreds of thousands of family hours of recreation in the hunting activities, in the hunting camps, in the hunting environments. I've never seen any of this stuff. I've never seen it. I've never seen anybody break a game law. Never even seen it. And if I had, I'd have, I'd have arrested them. I'm a special deputy in Michigan. I have been since 1978. And if I see any criminal activity, I take action. And I'm just a guitar player. So what you're talking about is America needs to get tough on all this criminal misbehavior and not tolerate it and go right to the punks in the black robes. They call themselves judges. I wouldn't let them judge a bikini contest. Most of the judges in this country don't have the faintest idea how to make a meaningful moral judgment based on the common sense of this nation. They have to take those black robes and choke them with them. The recidivism ep epidemic in this country is nothing short of phenomenal. So that's what you're talking about. Recidivism, by the way, that means repeat offenders for you college kids out there. <laughs> so you brought up a very important point, but you know who's at fault? It ain't the anti-hunters, it ain't the animal rights people, it's the own hunting community, apathetic bubbas. Yeah, that little Johnny, <laughs> opening day ain't till next week, but he's already got one, he's a character. No, he's not, he's a prick. And we gotta turn him in. And so all you hunters out there, if you got some bubbas in your camps who break the laws, you think it's cute. It ain't cute, because if we're going to get a headline story, it's going to be about some game-violating bubba.
So that's why we need to be proactive. We need to get those photos of the moms and the daughters and the sons and the fathers, the family with a trout, with a grouse, with a pheasant, with a dead deer, with some squirrels, with a 22. We need to get those positive images out there. But meanwhile, we've got t outdoor TV hosts that I wouldn't let babysit my Buick. <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, they're on TV and everybody turns on the, the, this outdoor television show and they see Bubba on there and they go, well, here's a brain dead numb nut. And he's on TV, he must be the best the hunting community has. What a bunch of dorks they must be. And that ain't accurate, it's not fair. It's because we failed to police our own ranks. Another hand was up here a second ago. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. You are? Yes. Please, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you being a member of the NRA, most people in the NRA are also members. I'm on the board of directors of the NRA. I got 150,000 votes to serve on the board, so if you voted for me, good work. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my, can everybody hear this young lady all right? She's a member of the NRA and she wants to know that in the face of all these violent eruptions, particularly the school shootings, what is my attitude on further restrictions of access to these firearms? Reasonably synopsized? Yeah. When I was a boy, I could pick up the phone. I could call any Sears or Montgomery Ward's mail order catalog and I could order real military guns <laughs> through the mail. No Brady waiting period, no instant check, no regulations, no restrictions. Anybody could go anywhere and get any kind of gun. And there was no such word as drive-by shooting. There was no such thing as a carjacking. It was unheard of. It had never happened. Follow me. No restrictions on firearms access. No school shootings. Over 25,000 laws on the books supposedly limiting access to firearms. And we have the most consistent violent outbursts in the history of this country. I'd like to go back to where there wasn't any, which means we only need one gun law in this country, a real gun law. Don't use one stupid. We only need one gun law. You misuse it, you're out of here. I believe in the death sentence at the scene of the crime. <laughs> in Buckhead, Georgia, goofball here comes walking in with a 45 and a 9 millimeter, walking from uh, office to office shooting people, and America's response was, follow me on this, I, I, might, I might have landed on the wrong planet, to a, a, a maniac now, by the way, I've got footage. I talked to the SWAT team down in Buckhead. He had his guns in his side. He was walking from room to room, shooting people, talking to him before he shot him. Hey, I'm, you know, I don't like the way I'm being treated around here. So he's kneeling down, and, my, and America's response to that was, follow me on this, to hide under tables and cry. Can someone help me? When is it appropriate to hide under tables and cry. Is, is there a tornado, a shooting, a rabid dog, um, bad hair day? What? Is there a reason to ever hide under a table and cry? While the guy's talking to his next victim, somebody shoot him. When he's talking to his next victim, break a chair over his head. When, the, when Klebold shot three kids under the tables crying, he broke open a double-barreled shotgun, ladies and gentlemen. Now follow me on this. I was never very good in math, but a double-barreled shotgun means two. He shot two rounds. He's out of ammo. This is a direct report from the SWAT team. He shot twice. He broke the side-by-side 12-gauge -side open. He ejected two smoking hulls out of the floor. The gun's still open. He's talking to his next victim, something along the lines of, do you believe in God? His gun's still broke in half. The smoking hulls are there. Six feet away are grown men under a table crying. 
How long does it take you to see a double barrel shotgun empty and get over there and knock his ass off? It's over. I just saved your life. No applause. Thank you. We are a nation of cowards hiding under tables crying. Uh, 25,000 gun laws. What do you think these creeps are waiting for 25,001? Give me a break. We need another gun law like I need another gun. <laughs> Anybody who thinks more gun laws will serve any purpose except to open the door to bad guys, Washington, D.C., in 1972, they banned the private ownership of all firearms. Wasn't a coincidence in 1972, they became the murder capital. Duh. Meanwhile, Bill Clinton, who wants to have more gun laws, just released 16 Puerto Rican terrorists who were caught with machine guns and bombs and had blown up American facilities and killed American law enforcement. He wants to pass more gun laws so you and I can't get a squirrel rifle that holds more than five bullets, but he's going to let convicted terrorists go who were convicted of the worst gun crimes of possible. The devil has landed. Any questions? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, an all women's hunt. I get to cook. <laughs> I wear a short skirt. No wonder. <laughs>